On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome back to the program the contributing editor of Harper's Magazine and the author of his latest, Lords of Secrecy, The National Security Elite and the American Stealth Foreign Policy. Scott Horton, welcome back to the program. Hey, great to be with you, Sam. So uh, let's start with the, um, uh, the most obvious of questions. Uh, who are the Lords of Secrecy? Well, if I have to give you just one portrait to keep in mind thinking of who they are, that would be Dick Cheney, no doubt about it. Uh, a Dick Cheney man who sat at the apex of our uh, national security elites for many, many years, White House Chief of Staff, uh, longtime Secretary of Defense, uh, prime defense advisor to uh, a number of presidents, and finally, uh, as vice president, uh, he's a great example. He's someone who rose, uh, rose politically using secrets very, very ably. In fact, uh, we know from uh, Angler, the biography uh, uh, that, was, uh, that Bark Elman did of him, that uh, he was so obsessed with secrets, he created his own secret categories and his own stamps, and he used them all the time. Uh, and he used secrets to uh, give greater authority uh, to his own views and analysis and to protect them uh, from criticism. And we saw that in, very much in the, in the uh, build-up to the Iraq War when we saw uh, Dick Cheney running around all over the place saying, based on super-secret intelligence that he had access to and we couldn't know, uh, that uh, that Saddam Hussein uh, was consorting with al-Qaeda and that he was building weapons of mass destruction. And of course, we know subsequently that was all other nonsense. There was no such intelligence. Um, but, uh, but to give a broader uh, description, the Lords of Secrecy are the senior figures in the nation's uh, defense and intelligence agencies who have the power to create secrets and who use that power to bolster their own importance uh, and political power and to uh, to ultimately to be the key decision makers on national security issues. So I mean this isn't a, this isn't a pathology, right? I mean we're not, we're not talking about pathology as much as a tactic. It's a tactic and uh, and in fact a large part of my book is what I call a sociological investigation. Uh, so I go back to uh, the writings of some of the founders of uh, modern uh, sociology as a political science uh, who studied bureaucracies uh, and the introduction of bureaucracies in Europe in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, and in so doing, uh, they, they found that, um, that secrecy, that bureaucracies loved secrecy, and particularly national security bureaucracies do, and that they systematically use secrecy for legitimate purposes, you know, for national defense purposes and to protect the privacy rights of individuals, but mostly they use them for illegitimate purposes which is to advance their own careers, protect themselves from criticism, and to claim control over issues that come up and policies that come up, so that only they are the people who are able to speak to these things, and only they are the people who, uh, uh, whose judgments count. Uh, and, of course, what was pointed out, particularly by Max Weber, um, and this is a little bit more than 100 years ago, uh, was that the, this was systematically at odds with democracy, and therefore it presented a big threat to democracy. And democracy couldn't dispense with secrets, but it did have to closely guard and limit the creation of secrets. And, 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 and I want to get to that because, I mean, a lot of that ties into uh, the, the, the um, uh, Thomas Drake um, and... And also what you're talking about in terms of, of the, uh, what it's done, what this sort of over-reliance of, on, on secrecy has done to our democracy. But let me, so, I mean, are we at a point now, and you make the argument in your book that we're at a, uh, we're at a, I guess, a, uh, a peak secrecy, if you will, and maybe maybe we're not at peak secrecy, but certainly we're at a higher point. Or we we have a higher concentration of secrecy than we've had in the past in our uh, country's history. Where did that like? Where did, has it always been the case, or was there a specific point where secrecy was introduced beyond? What one would need, and then another point where it uh, it, it became a, a much more active tool or actively used tool. 
yeah, I think we go through different historical phases. And I'd say, by the way, uh, no doubt about it, we're facing a crisis of secrecy right now. I mean, there are just in terms of raw numbers of secrets, we've never had so many. We've never been anywhere close to having so many secrets. Uh, the country's just awash in them. But if we go back all the way to the beginning, we've always had secrets. They've always been a part of our society uh, from the beginning. And secrets have usually been focused around military affairs um, and some intelligence gathering, and they've focused on wartime. So we've had wartime periods when we had secrets and kept them, and then after warfare, we sort of threw that out the window and didn't much care. We got to the creation of nuclear weapons and realized, hey, we've got to deal much more systematically and carefully uh, with this uh, technology. Uh, because it presents the threat to destroy humankind entirely, uh, and we can't allow it to proliferate. So we're going to put in really special controls, and that's when the you know the modern national security state state was created in 1947, uh, and uh, we had a much stricter regime of secrets. But I think in 1947 too, Congress. Um, and the political sector realized they thought a lot about the threat and risk of creating too many secrets. So they put pretty careful checks on the process, too, and they made sure that there was always plenty of information in the public sector so we could have valid discussions of these things. And I think, um, you know, we get to the Cold War, we have, a, we have a sort of rough and tumble war over secrets over and over again. We had Vietnam where we had the Pentagon Papers case. Uh, but really, since 9-11 is when we've seen this explode. And in a sense, it's sort of strange, because in the Cold War, we were facing existential threats from a very sophisticated enemy. That really did justify the need for secrets. Uh, currently, we're dealing with non-existential threats from a not very sophisticated uh, enemy. But nevertheless, this is being used to justify a far higher level of secrecy than we've ever experienced before. And, and we can measure that by, you know, uh, I, mean, I remember one figure that came out when uh, uh, during uh, uh, Chelsea Manning um, uh, uh, trials was that there there's some three and a half million people with top clearance of I mean that's a lot of that's a lot of people who are you know secreted in I guess I mean how would you uh, how do we measure how many secrets there are is I mean is that a a, a representation yeah, yes. I mean, you know, who's author? And in fact, we have estimates that go up to more than four and a half million people uh, who are authorized to uh, deal with secret and top secret information in the United States uh, by some counts. And uh, a lot of them are government servants. They're people you would expect in the Department of Defense and in the intelligence community. But a large number of them, a much growing number of them today, are contractors who are working in all sorts of different agencies that produce uh, telecommunications equipment. Uh, uh, armaments, uh, all sorts of new technologies. They're also given uh, security classifications. So it's spreading like wild. Uh, and I would say some measure of that is not surprising. But then we look at the total quantum of secrets that are prepared. Uh, and, you know, we're, p we're putting out $11 billion a year just to keep secrets. Uh, and every time our experts start going through the stack, they say, look, it's, it's a safe guess that most secrets shouldn't be secrets. But we've created a default situation in which it's better, safer, easier to call everything a secret. Um, and uh, contractors and others feel instinctively that if uh, they write up a report and they put a secret stamp on it, people are more likely to read it than if they don't. Right. Right. Of course. So it raises... my work is important. So therefore, it's secret. I mean, I wonder. Does that like? I mean, does the does the creating and the expansion of the apparatus? Right now, we have like three, four million people who have access to special knowledge, theoretically. Right. That we that the rest of us don't. Does that like sort of create a bucket that then sort of it, it's a it creates the uh, the the opening for those who are using it as a tactic, but also the incentives to create more secrets because you want to, uh, you need to create a hierarchy within that, you know, uh, that, that sort of realm. I mean, it's, it, it, I, I'm just curious as to how this is happening. Like, what are the driving factors? I mean, I know you also point in your book to uh, the, the post-Vietnam era, which 
it's which is in some ways ironic because you know we had the first sort of slapping down i guess of uh, of the CIA at that time which ostensibly is about sort of pushing back on this secrecy or on the sort of stealth stuff. I mean, how do you uh, walk us through that and, and, and that sort of tension there? Well, let's go back again and look at, you know, how secrecy is used. And on this score, you know, Max Weber really brilliantly analyzed it. And he said, you know, uh, just looking at how it was used during the First World War, he said consistently people who have the power to create secrets use it to advance their own careers, okay? So by saying that their work is secret, they're saying that their work is important. And then by calling it secret, they can hide their work from people who might have a critical or different view of it and will be in a position to effectively criticize it. So they insulate themselves from criticism or a finding that they did something wrong or made mistakes. Then he went on to say, corruption, corruption loves secrecy. You put a secrecy stamp on it, law enforcement can't penetrate inside of it and find out that something illegal or corrupt has happened. So this is how you found secrecy pervading the defense contracting area uh, with corruption alongside, and the corruption is absolutely thriving. And finally, he says, looking at this whole system, well, actually, pretty mediocre and indeed even sometimes stupid people rose to the top of these bureaucracies uh, and they rose to the top because of secrecy. You know, had everything been out in the open, they couldn't have survived uh, in, a, in a situation in which they were being called on their mistakes uh, and errors. So that's a huge risk that you've got with secrecy that you've got to act against. And then if we look in the situation in Vietnam, I mean, Vietnam was the first war in our nation's history that was really um, managed, stage managed completely by these national intelligence elites. They did it. They didn't want to have a, a democratic dialogue about it. They avoided it. Um, you know, we had the Tonkin Gulf incident, some resolutions voted, but we never really had the sort of consistent uh, public debate and decision involving Congress uh, to go forward that America had historically had uh, with wars, at least wars when there was time to deliberate and think about them. Uh, and it, there was, this was a, it was a brilliant war, as David Halberstam said, but it was also stupid in common sense terms. And, and you know, it was common sense stupid because you didn't have that public discussion. So they had a pretty traumatic slapdown after the Vietnam War. Uh, their wings were clipped pretty badly. They were publicly humiliated. And, and after that, national security elites you know, resolved, what can we do to uh, blunt the pressure that comes from public discussion and democratic process? And they, in fact, took a number of steps that were explicitly designed to do that. So one of, one of the points was, you know, people become very upset when brothers and sisters and fathers are sent off to foreign countries to fight and are wounded and killed. They become very, very engaged and concerned about these matters. Uh, so mm, let's eliminate the uh, draft. Let's have only a volunteer army. Let's avoid reporting about casualties and right. fatalities. Let's not have photographs of those coffins returning at the end of the war. Let's not allow reporters to go in and report on these things. And then let's use military contractors rather than men and women in uniform to do this. And let's not give any information about the military contractors that we use. So we saw this steady shift from uniform military uh, to contractors. And finally, we come to robotic war. Warfare. So, uh, you know, we have our robots, our drones, our technology waging the war. We've developed technologies and we have put a premium on development of technologies uh, that reduce and even eliminate the risk of, uh, of fatality to American service personnel. Uh, and if you look at the uh, Office of Legal Counsel's opinion justifying um, circumventing Congress and public discussion in connection with the commitment of forces to Libya in, uh, in 2011, uh, OLC says there, well, you know, there are no Americans who are at risk of being killed as a result of this, so there's no need for public debate or discussion. That's a pretty outrageous concept, but it reflects exactly what the national security elites have pretty much always thought. All right, I want I want to separate a couple of these things because uh, some of the OLC stuff I think is 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 stunning because we saw it I mean throughout the Bush administration and and into uh 
the Obama administration, uh, we basically had the development of secret law in the context of, of the NSA spying and in the targeted assassination program, and like you say, in terms of, of Libya. But before, before we get there, so, so you know, their response, the response to, um, uh, to Vietnam with the idea of, like, um, we're not going to show caskets, we're, not, we're only going to have embedded reporters, um, we're going to have a, a volunteer army— is that on a spectrum of secrecy? I mean, because it, it functions to basically say, let's just, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And then you hit a, do you hit a, a wall where it's just like, not only out of sight, out of mind, but if it's in your mind, we're just going to make sure it's also out of sight. And that's where we draw that line uh, so that we can basically not have to deal with the messy part of democracy, which is some measure of accountability. I, I think that's that's hitting the nail on the head exactly. So, you know, it's impossible to say um, that uh, you know uh, that fatality, the casualty statistics are secret and the public can't know these things. Um, that would just be, uh, you know, that would be so ridiculous that uh, you know there there are few officials in the Pentagon who would ever try that. But I mean, but, we are. But, I mean, I mean, on some level, we are close to that, right? I mean, when we have close, so much what, covert what they, operations, we don't even know. Not only do we not know how many people have died in pursuing a certain agenda, we don't even know what that agenda is in the way that we wage war. Well, that, that's right. So, with respect to disaggregated disag- information, it's denied. But what they've done is systematically make it much more difficult for anybody to get access to that information. So there is just a, a, what I'd say, sort of a growing fog of quasi-secrecy. Let's say, you know, it's not formally classified as secret, but it's not transparent. And what we previously had was a, was a policy of publicity. That is, you know, the people have a right to know we'll give them this information. Uh, and, you know, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he was writing about America in the early 19th century, said, you know, this is the country of astonishing publicity, where the people actually seem to know all sorts of things about their political office holders and their government that we back in France and in Europe don't know. Uh, and it produces a different political culture, a, a political culture which is fundamentally more democratic than we know. Well, he was right about that. Uh, and he was right the publicity was the key element in driving that. So does de Tocqueville now look at our country and say, geez, what happened, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think de Tocqueville coming back today would say, hmm, America looks a lot more like France and the Ancien Regime. <laughs> right. Somebody dropped <laughs> Which the ball. Which is true. It, yeah, it does. I mean, you know, it is a much more secretive government, uh, and it's, it's a much more burdensome enormous state apparatus that America had back in the period of the early 19th century when he was writing. But, and, I mean, I mean, to a certain extent, there's a certain amount of inevitability, right? I mean, because you're talking about, uh, you know, whatever, 20 times, 25 times more, uh, 30 times more people uh, that we have now. I mean, we have a much, much larger society, I guess. I mean, I guess the, so, I mean, let's, let's move, because there's, there, there are two arguments that you're making, uh, that, that, uh, about secrecy. Um, one is, and, and I want to just say, uh, one is th- the implications for democracy. The other is a more sort of, I guess, pragmatic one is that the, the secrecy, the sort of the, the, the Weber work, uh, where secrecy, uh, is corrosive to, to competency on some level. And that, that to me, is what has always astonished me about the Thomas Drake story. Uh, You you talk a little bit about that, uh, because I think when we talk about... When we talk about uh, things like... um, uh, Snowden, and we talk about whether or not Petraeus is going to get in trouble for uh, leaking information uh, based upon sort of the precedents that have been set by the Obama administration, I think one thing that is lost is just like... Some of this stuff is is so the 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 reasons for maintaining secrecy are so sort of mundane. I mean, this is like the Denny's manager stuff. You know what I mean? Where the guy's just like, I'm not gonna. It's totally secret. I can't let the the wait staff know why I'm doing this. And it's basically because you know whatever he's drinking, <laughs> he's drinking uh, half the stock or whatever it is. You know, I mean, it's it's it, that's what the Thomas Drake story is to me. It's just sort of covering somebody's ass. 
I, I think that's right. But I, I, I go back and just reinforce, you broke things down perfectly. That is, you have to deal with secrecy uh, at several different levels. You know, the top level here is, you know, at some point, too much secrecy means you cease to be a democracy anymore. The people aren't having a say. Uh, and the acid test for any democracy is whether the people have a meaningful say about decisions of war and peace. If they don't, you can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. You're not really a democratic society. Uh, and America has, I think, taken great pride historically and always ensuring that there's public debate, public discussion, and some role for the people to have a say uh, about these decisions of war and peace. That's always been a very important part of our uh, political culture. And it's an area that's slipping away, and the major reason is secrecy. It, it boils down to this idea. If the critical facts you have to know to make the call are all classified as secret, and only a handful of people know them, then you can't have the public discussion about this. Uh, you can't involve the public about it. You can't even or don't really want to even involve Congress on it. So then it's only the Lords of Secrecy uh, and the White House staff who are going to discuss these things and make the calls. So that's that's a very, very grave development, which I think the developments in, in Libya in 2011 demonstrate very well. But then the other case is just having a competent, effective, well-run bureaucracy, because we recognize, you know, we're saddled with it. You know, we're not going back to the days of ancient Greece when there weren't bureaucracies. We're going to have bureaucracies. They're going to be an important part of our lives. And it really matters that they are effectively run and well run and that bureaucrats are not using secrecy to cover up petty corruption to cloak their mistakes and so forth and i think the thomas drake case is it's really a great example of someone who was a, a very noble effective civil servant uh, who started looking at a program into which billions of dollars were being sunk and said, this is ridiculous, this is corrupt, it's a horrible program, and we have generated within the agency a program that's more effective than that program that costs us a tiny fraction of it, and it actually works. So what what's going on here? There's some sort of corruption going on here, and that got uh, published, revealed, journalists won awards for it, uh, but people Congress the, shut down the program. Pro Congress shut down the program, and people at the top of the CIA, uh, excuse me, at the top of the NSA, and particularly General Hayden, were horribly embarrassed by these disclosures, and I would say had rather suspicious relations and dealings uh, with the contractors that were involved there that had never been effectively explained, and they decided to launch a vendetta against uh, against Drake, and they did this saying, oh, he's the man who's leaking information about the Prisma pro the PRISM program, which of course he wasn't at all. But, you know, they had uh, FBI agents crawling all over him, working uh, um, uh, overtime, trying to build a case against him, raiding his house, sticking guns in his face, going after his family and friends and so on. Uh, you know, acts of just gross intimidation, totally unwarranted. Uh, and it was because of their fear that some of their other problems would be exposed, problems which were, you know, where they had gone forward with a program that even the senior legal officials in the Bush administration thought was not legal. You know, we had uh, the acting attorney general threatened to resign together with the head of the FBI over that program. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it's a, it's a jaw-dropping example of abuse of power and abuse of secrecy. And in fact, the man who is all over the airwaves today uh, pushing the secrecy agenda, pushing back against the uh, Senate uh, torture report, General Michael Hayden, is the guy who's responsible for all those abuses. Uh, you know, and he's because of secrecy, he's never been held to account before it, and his role has been effectively obscured. And and and, and it also, you know, you you make an example of Thomas Drake. You're sending messages uh, theoretically to all the potential Thomas Drakes who may say, who may become a whistleblower, either out of conscience if you're uh, Edward Snowden, or just simply saying like, hey, what? Why are we paying, you know, uh, this much for a hammer? Uh, essentially, is what, what what Drake did, and and uh, you're sending a message like you don't mess with the boss. 
I, that's that's exactly correct, and that's, that's the reason why I argue that the whistleblower statutes that we have in place that address the national security situation don't work effectively, uh, because people you know in Washington have been watching for years and seeing that the Thomas Drakes, the people who go forward and say I'm concerned about corruption or ineptitude, they discover that the instant they go forward and do this, you know, performing a legitimate laudable social function, they become, they have an, uh, a cross on their back immediately. They become the targets. Senior figures in the national intelligence apparatus go after them and work very, very hard to destroy these people. So the consequence is nobody wants to go and use these whistleblower uh, channels that have been created by federal law. They're seeing really that the only alternative, frankly, is you go to the press. Right. That's the only thing that works. All right, let's let's just turn um, uh, briefly, if we could, to the CIA, because uh, what has gone on with the CIA, and particularly, I mean, I guess uh, today, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, the um, the CIA Accountability Board, head by Evan Bai, this is not, I'm not making a joke here, <laughs> uh, the CIA Accountability Board reversed the findings of the CIA Inspector General, who incidentally just resigned last week, uh, that in fact the CIA did not spy on the Senate Intelligence Committee, but the Senate Intelligence Committee did inappropriate things uh, to the CIA. And this is basically, this is them writing the coda to this entire story where nobody gets punished, nobody's held accountable for torture. In fact, everybody involved is promoted. And John Brennan's out there. He is completely unscathed. The CIA has not lost an ounce of its mandate. If anything, it's increased its power. It gets to write the end of this story. Uh, and, 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 and that's it. I mean, to me, and, and let me ask your opinion on this, Scott. I mean, is this indicative of sort of the, what people call the submerged state or that there is a deep state apparatus. Like, in other words, the national security apparatus is, um, is, is essentially uh, the, their, it is the only constant. You can, presidents come and go, but we're always here and we tell them what they do. Well, I, I, I think it, this is another really important development, and I think it does uh, increasingly point to a situation in which the uh, CIA is unaccountable. Um, you know, people break laws, uh, engage in corrupt activities, um, and uh, uh, do things that are stupid and foolish, and this never has a negative consequence as long as it gained a wink and a nod from senior management uh, of the CIA, which increasingly it does. Uh, so does that mean we have a deep state? Yes, that means we're moving very close to a situation where there's a deep state, where there is a part, a very powerful, uh, a very potent part of the state apparatus that's simply not accountable under the law and is entitled to act uh, independently of democratic processes and the law. That's the definition uh, of this term as it's been developed. Um, and I would say they also are exercising incredible political power. So one thing that appears in the background of the Senate Select Committee report is if you look at the chart out the relationship between the CIA and all these other agencies of government, you see all the other agencies uh, deferring to and in awe of the CIA. I would even say they're afraid of the CIA. They don't want to cross the CIA, and that goes particularly for the White House today. So, you know, how does this resemble a democracy? It doesn't at all. And I'd say also just having read the uh, the by uh, um, uh, Bauer uh, report and compared it with uh, what survives censorship from the Inspector General's report, I would say you you're like struck immediately at these two documents. The Inspector General's report is a careful, meticulous critical, objective review of the facts, the by um, Bauer report is a shameless, pathetic piece of whitewash. Nonsensical. It, it starts from the very beginning accepting as a fact all of the claims that were advanced by 
uh, the CIA uh, against the Senate, um, accepting absurd legal positions they put forward as correct without any objective or independent analysis of these positions. And, and, you know, it's very, very clear that John Brennan tapped these two people and assigned them to go write a whitewash for him, and that's exactly what they've done. But even there, this report points, all fingers point to John O. Brennan. So all these people who engaged in this nefarious and improper conduct, which even this report concludes it was, uh, uh, say that, well, but Brennan told us to do it. He made all these statements criticizing the Senate committee, and he said all these things, and, you know, this appeared to us to be clearance to go do the things we did, you know? Who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? Mm. Um, that's what it looked like. So they took that as authority to act, and, well, the director authorized it. So, end of inquiry. And one thing that, that uh, By and Bauer uh, point out is that we were not authorized or directed to investigate John O'Brennan. <laughs> so this is another one of these reports right. where it's looking down the line of responsibility, not up the line. Uh, and Brennan, but I would say Brennan quite plainly is the person who bears responsibility. And the fact that he continues after all of this as director of the CIA to me is jaw dropping. Yeah, it's um, and uh, of course um, uh, we should remind people that Brennan was there was an attempt that Brennan was going to be made uh, a head of the CIA back in the first Obama administration. He was rejected because of his uh, uh, close proximity uh, or uh, to the torture regime, which obviously is not uh, it's not transparent. Uh, he says he wasn't involved, but uh, there are others who argue that he was a little bit closer to the um, to what was going on. He became a, a counterterrorism advisor and only became CIA director after uh, it was revealed uh, that David Petraeus had a um, had a uh, 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 an affair, I guess, is really basically, and um, we've since seen uh, Petraeus now uh, also uh, gave uh, secret documents to his uh, his biographer slash uh, paramour, I guess, um, just to want to catch people up. He's, I got to say, uh, Brennan, very fortunate guy that he had the opportunity to uh, be head of the CIA after all under those circumstances. Uh, and we, I guess we can leave it there with that. Who yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, he had a lot of people running around aggressively giving testimony for him, uh, including Harold Coe, uh, but several others as well, saying he was a stand-up sort of guy. He was good. Uh, he was reasonable on all these issues. He's sort of the best sort of person you're going to get. And I have to say, wow, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, that I was the big push I think he's with part Brandon. Of the problem. But he, that was the big push with Brennan when he was getting appointed, right? Was that he's the guy who's actually going to come in and corral and corral the CIA from its expansiveness. Uh, that, that's correct. And at the same time, he was telling his friends at the agency that he was going to protect them from any negative repercussions. So I think I think the assurances he he gave to figures who were involved in the torture and black sites program have tr have been borne out as correct. The assurances he gave to folks in the White House, absolutely not. I mean, for instance, one particular promise he made uh, was to pare back the scope of the drone program and to agree to most of this being transited to the Department of Defense. Um, and he made that promise and then absolutely undermined it so it never happened. Uh, so he has in every way been... Uh, an aggressive advocate uh, for the expansive power and position of the CIA. And we should all go back and look at the uh, National Security Act of 1947 and what it says about the CIA. I think uh, modern readers of that would be shocked to look at what exists in Langley today because our current CIA has nothing to do with the CIA that was actually created by statute. It's a totally different entity. It has its own army. It has its own air force. Most of its activities focus on operations, not on intelligence analysis. Um, it, it's just a – it is the entity that it has desi desired to create of itself. Let's. I, I know uh, you've got to get going here, but uh, le just uh, lastly, let's just focus on on the complicitness of a the media, but also it seems to me the public. I mean, the public at large doesn't seem to care not just about what's going on in terms of the CIA, but doesn't seem to care about 
these issues writ large. You know, uh, the, the there just does not seem to be a concern. Uh, it's it's almost as if the public has said, like, we appreciate you're taking it out of sight. That way, we don't have to think about it. Well, uh, I I would say, as as philosophers have, that interest is contagious. You know, the more you know, the more you're able to put things together, the more you have an analytical perspective, um, and the more you are interested in engaging and discussing things. So, uh, so secrecy sucks the oxygen out of the room and leaves people without the information to have a discussion and without the necessary interest to have the discussion to start with. Uh, so it becomes self-serving. So you can say, well, the people really aren't interested in this, and therefore we can make all the decisions, and why should we bother bringing them into the process? So the answer is that more information should be available, and more information being available would provoke more discussion and more engagement with the issues and a more sophisticated and better answer and position being taken by the country, that's what it means to be a democracy. How is that cycle, though, uh, this, this sort of self-reinforcing uh, cycle, how is that broken? Because, I mean, if it, if it didn't break here, uh, we're now, I guess, less than a year after Dianne Feinstein gave, uh, stood on the Senate floor and gave what uh, Patrick Leahy said was the most important speech he had heard in his, whatever, 20-some-odd years plus as a senator— uh, basically saying, hey, the, the CIA spied on us. Uh, that's a real problem. I mean, this, this should theoretically have been some type of constitutional crisis, right? And now it's just like, well, it's all wrapped up. Evan Bayh came out and said they did nothing wrong. The end. I mean, wh wh what's it going to take to break this cycle if that didn't do it? Well, I think, you know, there are there are certainly some powerful forces working in the world in the opposite direction right now. And one of them uh, is the process of leaking. So, you know, more information coming out demonstrating that, you know, leaders in the national security establishment are misleading the public, are misdescribing these programs, leads to higher levels uh, of uh, skepticism in the public and an unwillingness to simply accept at face value what they're told also leads to a recognition that Congress is not doing its job properly. Um, uh, and I think we see it having more effect in democratic societies overseas than the United States, particularly you look at uh, many of the European states where you see there is, there's no anti-Americanism that I can see, but there's a lot of negative views towards the American intelligence community, the NSA and the CIA. Attitudes there have changed uh, quite a bit. And consumers are having some effect. I mean, consumers, I think, are uh, particularly in Europe, you know, willing to punish Silicon Valley producers who work or collaborate too closely with the NSA um, and uh, open a back door to them uh, to get private information because the marketplace will go with other providers who don't do so. And that in turn has an effect on, um, on the marketplace. So I think you know, there are positive forces out there. Uh, and for the long term, I'm not entirely pessimistic about this, but you know, it's going to be a long, slow, difficult road. Scott Horton, Contributing editor to Harper's Magazine, author of the latest Lords of Secrecy, The National Security Elite in America's Stealth Foreign Policy. Thanks so much for your time today. We will link to your, uh, your new book on uh, Majority.fm. Really appreciate the time.